Classic of Difficulties. Greetings, and welcome to Classic of Difficulties, Difficult Questions in Medicine, Acupuncture, and Beyond. I am your host, Dr. James Mohabali. I'm a doctor of acupuncture and Chinese medicine, and I will be your armchair philosopher in residence and your tour guide as we try to ask some difficult questions about medicine, health, alternative medicine, and maybe the meaning of life. My goal in this podcast is that by asking and unpacking these tough questions, we will maybe leave with a couple of answers, but we will definitely leave with more questions than we had at the start. This is episode 5, What is the Ideal Diet? Well, if you've been following us here on Classic of Difficulties, you might have noticed that these past few episodes have been a little... heavy. They have been hard-hitting, philosophical, very, very enjoyable, but certainly not summertime beach-listening road trip material. Unless your idea of a road trip takes place in the back room of a dusty, dark library. And here, in North Carolina, it is most certainly beach-going season. The water might be a little cold for some of you, but we have had the occasional 90-degree, beautiful, sunny day since the beginning of April. People are donning their swimsuits, their bikinis, speedos, trunks, and they are getting ready to bear it all on the sandy shores of the Atlantic Ocean. So what better topic for our show today than the perennial question of all people interested in health, fitness, and impressing strangers on the beach? The topic today is, what is the ideal diet? That's right, we try to answer the very difficult question about what you should be eating, what you should be buying at the store, and how to figure out these tough questions for yourself and your body. There are a lot of opinions now, especially with the rising popularity of diets that totally and completely invert our usual understanding of health, like the ketogenic diet, where you mostly eat fat and almost no carbs, or the carnivore diet which is a meat-based diet, where all those supposedly healthy fruits and veggies are totally and completely off the table. So we will try to make heads or tails of all of these diets and try to help you navigate what you should be putting in your mouth and how often and all of that good stuff. But this episode is going to be light. It's going to be practical and it should be, above all, easy for you to digest because we all know how much contradictory and difficult information is already out there about what food choices to make. So, let's have some fun. And me? My idea of fun is, you guessed it, Chinese medicine. So let's start there. I'm going to tell you right now, and I fully and completely accept the risk that you will just click away to the next video as soon as you hear this. Chinese medicine does not have such a thing as an ideal diet. There's not one perfect way to eat that applies to everyone. You know, frustrating, right? You just wanted to know about the ideal diet. You just clicked on this video just to hear about it. And here I am telling you there isn't one. In Chinese medicine, we think that everyone is different. Everyone is an individual and everyone is unique. Chinese medicine is an individualized medicine. And since everybody's body runs in a different way... So, in theory, everyone needs to eat something a little bit different. But today, we are keeping it simple. We will get into all that individual, personalized stuff in another upcoming episode on diet. But today, I will tell you the general, basic things that Chinese medicine does have to say about the ideal diet. My goal is that by the end of this episode, you will be able to take everything that we've talked about and apply it to your life immediately. There are certain rules that we can say any diet must follow in order to be healthy. Certain laws, so to speak, that you can't get around no matter what you eat, whether you're a carnivore, vegan, what have you. In this video, we will cover those laws of healthy eating. In the next videos in the series, we will cover the things that you need to know to make your diet appropriate for the unique individual that you are. First things first, no matter who you are, no matter where you are, no matter what you eat, you have to make sure that the food that you're eating has qi in it, which sort of requires us to define this concept of qi. Qi is, of course, the cornerstone of Chinese medical thinking. It is the basis of our whole physiology. It's what runs through the acupuncture channels. It's really a big deal, and if you don't understand qi, 
you probably don't understand Chinese medicine. But here's the thing, it's an untranslatable word that people try to translate in a variety of incomplete ways. Untranslatable? That sounds complicated. It is. It's very complicated. And I guaranteed that I was going to keep this episode light, so I am. So we're actually going to avoid the discussion and definition of qi entirely and just say that you want your food to be lively, you want it to be vibrant, you want it to be delicious, you want it to be full of life, full of joy, full of vitamins and colors and all that good stuff. That is what it means when food has qi. So what is the difference between freshly cooked food, for example, and week-old leftovers? Freshly cooked food has plenty of qi, and the leftovers, they have less qi. What's the difference between perfectly stir-fried broccoli and broccoli that has been boiled until it's gray and stinky and unrecognizable? Well, the perfectly stir-fried broccoli has lots of qi, and the boiled broccoli's qi was damaged by the cooking process that we submitted it to. What's the difference between that lumpy, misshapen, unique farmer's market apple that tastes juicy and beautiful, and that perfect seeming, shiny, red delicious from the grocery store that really just, when you bite into it, tastes like a giant ball of wax? Well, the farmer's market apple has chi, and the grocery store red delicious has basically none. So what affects the chi of the food? How do we get food with chi in it? There's a lot of different things. First, growing conditions and farming practices. Second, the time the plant is harvested. Third, the chi of the particular plant, both in terms of species and variety. Like, lettuce is different than carrots, which is obvious, but what might not be so obvious is that since they're different, they do different things in the body. In a more subtle way, Thai basil is different than Genevieve's basil, and so they must do different things in the body. Cooking processes and food preparation also play into chi. The way you cook food matters. How long the food has been stored, both in terms of storage after cooking, like the leftovers we were just talking about, but also the storage before cooking, like the multiple weeks to several months of transit processing and storage that all that grocery store produce has gone through. I recently read that Lettuce, which is one of the fresher ones, takes about two weeks to get to the shelf. So that lettuce that you see has already been cut and sitting there in somebody's shelf for two weeks. Apples, a little bit more shocking, apples have been sitting around for 9 to 12 months before you see them, so they do not have a whole lot of chi left over by that time. And of course, the chi of our food is influenced by the chi of the chef who made the food, because food tastes better when it's made by someone you love, especially if that someone you love happens to be a good cook. It's always a plus. So let's go through these things one by one. First, we have growing conditions and farming practices. So we've all heard about the obvious issue of pesticides and toxic things and using tons and tons of artificial fertilizers and soil additives and all these things that are made in labs that for some reason or another, modern man loves to spray on our vegetables. That's an obvious no-go for most people that are interested in health. So generally, if you can, eat organic. It's a pretty good idea. But if you can't, we totally understand here in Chinese medicine. Organic stuff is expensive, and it can be hard to get in certain areas of the country. I'm going to say this one and I'll say it again. Eating organic is not the end-all be-all of health. A strong, healthy body can deal with a little bit of toxic chemicals here and there. Is it important to eat organic? Absolutely. Is it the end of the world if you can't? No, it's not. There is something that's a lot more damaging than eating conventional non-organic foods, and it's something that I see a lot more often in the acupuncture clinic, and it's called orthorexia, which is Greek for correct eating. It is an eating disorder, and it means that someone is totally and completely obsessed with only eating the best, the cleanest, the most correct foods. You can have an orthorexic vegan, you can have an orthorexic carnivore, you can have an orthorexic keto person. Orthorexia can be part of any diet. What is the word for a keto person, by the way? Is it ketonite, or maybe ketonian, or 
after having been keto for long enough, do they actually finally just turn into ketones? In Chinese medicine, we recognize that nothing in life is perfect. And so, naturally, your diet won't be perfect either. So, our first step to eating healthy? Loosen up. It's just food. So back to growing conditions. The thing about growing conditions and farming practices is that it doesn't just end with avoid chemicals. Anyone who's ever had wine, for example, knows that two different wines, made from the exact same species and variety of grape, can taste very, very different when they're from two different vineyards. Like a French Cabernet tastes very different than a California Cabernet, which tastes very different than an Australian Cabernet. But these differences can get really, really specific. In fact, expert wine tasters can pinpoint the region, often down to the exact vineyard and the exact year, just using the information that they know about historical climate data, soil composition, geographical regions, and of course their own highly refined sense of smell and taste. In some cases, there are even vineyards that are directly adjacent to each other, like one on one side of the stream and the other on the other, or maybe across the road from each other, and the wine from these two vineyards actually tastes completely different. One might command a very, very high price, and the other could be a middling-grade wine at best. <clears throat> All of these geographical, geological, and climatic influences are grouped together in Chinese thinking, and they get grouped under the idea of the qi of the grape. The circumstances under which the grape grew up influence who the grape is. Apply to you, what makes you who you are, where you grew up, who was president at the time you were a kid, what shows were on TV, what schools you went to, who were your friends in high school. All of that stuff is aggregated into the chi of who you are. But a little more went into you than just where you planted your roots. Your mom and dad also have some influence, not just genetically speaking, which is very important, but things like did they give you lots and lots of positive encouragement, or were they distant and aloof? There are systems of agriculture that put a lot of emphasis into these little things, this, you know, positive encouragement, aloofness. They, um, you can think about the old science fair experiment of growing certain plants and playing one set of plants Mozart, and growing these other plants and playing those plants heavy metal. The Mozart plants always win. They're green and happy and organized, and the heavy metal plants, they just don't do as well. Biodynamics is probably the largest example of a system of agriculture that actually puts the chi of the plant and the farm at center stage. They do a lot of stuff with plant and animal symbiotic relationships. They pay attention to the cycles of the sun, moon, and stars and their influence on the plant. And of course, they pay particular attention to the liveliness of the soil. Biodynamics is a system of agriculture that is started by the philosophies of Rudolf Steiner, but nowadays you can even find biodynamic products in places like Whole Foods. The key idea of biodynamics, and the key idea of Chinese medical thinking about food, is that food isn't just healthy because it happens to be a specific species and variety of plant. Like broccoli isn't automatically healthy because it's broccoli. We think that healthiness comes about because the plant or the animal, is actually in a healthy relationship with the natural world, with the influences of heaven and earth. And our job, as the farmers of this broccoli, is to encourage and cultivate the plant's healthy relationship with heaven and earth, and our own healthy relationship with both the plant and with heaven and earth. From this, it's really easy to see why chronic disease is running rampant nowadays, why food allergies are worse than they ever have been before, and why everyone and their mother seems to be intolerant of gluten all of a sudden, when for thousands of years, half the world lived on glutinous grains like wheat. Our food is poisoning us, because we are poisoning our food. It's really that simple. And our relationship to food is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to our unhealthy un relationship with the world around us. Modern man is completely out of sync with the world around him. I can hear you thinking... Yeah, everybody knows we're poisoning the earth and causing ecological catastrophes left and right. That's old news. Well, we might all be familiar with the argument that we're in a toxic relationship with earth, but part of what makes biodynamics and Chinese medicine unique in this discussion 
is that we're not just talking about man's relationship to Earth. As I've said before, in episode one, man mediates between heaven and Earth. Man is this bridge that bridges these two things. That's what the upright posture is about. That's what our job is. So without paying heed to the fullness of man's experience, without paying attention to both his spiritual life, his heavenly life, and his earthly life, we inevitably fall short. And the food we grow will always reflect both our spiritual sickness and our earthly sickness. So our relationship to heaven is just as important to the health of our food and our bodies as our relationship to earth. So the beginning of healthy food is healthy chi in the plant, which grew in healthy soil at the right time in accordance with heaven and was treated nicely and had a happy and harmonious life before it was so brutally cut short by Farmer John and his harvesting team. Then we have this beautiful, happy, perfect plant, and we buy it from the market, and we get it into our kitchen. So the question is, what do we do with it? We have a lot of options. We could boil it into oblivion, like I was talking about earlier. We could deep fry it. We could steam it. Sounds healthy. We could stir fry it, or we could just eat it raw. Or, God forbid, we could microwave it. But more on microwaves later. So the Chinese thinking about food, which I personally think makes sense, is that we want to cook everything perfectly so that the inherent character of the ingredient is best showcased. Let's take broccoli, for example. I think it's a particularly good example because Chinese didn't originally have broccoli. Broccoli is a Western plant. They have Chinese broccoli over there, gailan, but that's really kind of a different thing. It's leafy and it's light and it doesn't really look a whole lot like broccoli. In fact, multiple times in the Asian market, I've kind of passed over it because I thought it wasn't broccoli. I thought it was something else entirely. But, of course, everyone who has had Chinese takeout knows beef and broccoli. It's a staple dish. And Chinese people, even in China, they actually love Western broccoli now that they do have it. So it's a perfect example of taking a philosophy of food, a Chinese philosophy in this case, taking this way of thinking and applying it to new, modern, evolving circumstances. It's adaptation. So there's a lot of ways that you can eat and prepare broccoli. We will start with raw broccoli, for example. And raw broccoli, forgive me, but it is just not my favorite food. I really don't like it. It's hard to digest. The texture is weird. It kind of feels like you're chewing on a hairbrush, to be honest. Even if you slather it in ranch, it's just not great. I personally wouldn't ever consider eating raw broccoli if it weren't for those weird catering platters that invariably include it, kind of implicitly insisting to you that it's just as good as carrot sticks or celery sticks, and that it's totally socially acceptable to just lay out raw broccoli for your guests. Yuck. Let's take the other end of the spectrum, broccoli that's been boiled for a long time. We already talked about this earlier. It just kind of smells like sulfur and it's mushy, and it doesn't have any of those positive attributes of broccoli. From a Western scientific perspective, by boiling it for a long time, you've actually gone and destroyed all those nice nutrients, those vitamins and minerals that are in the broccoli. So the question is, what do the Chinese do with broccoli? Well, in order to cook broccoli in the Chinese way, first you must blanch it. You put it in boiling water very, very briefly for like 10 seconds. You dunk it in for 10 seconds and then it's done. It's beautiful. As soon as the broccoli hits the water, the whole thing flashes into this rich emerald green. And then nine seconds later, you take it out. So you take that broccoli and then you toss it into a very hot wok and then you stir fry it. I know this because I did it the other day and it was awesome. It came out perfectly. The broccoli was crisp. It was not too stiff, and it looked green and happy and tender. And, of course, it was covered in oyster sauce, so that's always good. So not only do we have to get high-quality, happy plants and animals, we also have to do our part in the process. We have to cook them in a way that really honors them, a way that really honors the ingredient, 
Farmer John didn't spend all of that time growing the broccoli just so that you could go and destroy all of the chi that him and the broccoli had worked so hard on. That chi is like the life story of the broccoli. That, and the life story of Farmer John, for that matter. You want the broccoli to be able to tell its life story. You want it to be able to tell you about where it grew, about the climate when it was growing up. You want to hear about every little detail. And same thing with the cow that becomes your T-bone snake. The cow has had this whole long, beautiful life on this farm, and you want to hear about it. So how do we hear about the story of our food? How do we interact with the life and the narrative of food? We eat it. We put it into our mouth. We chew, and we pay attention, giving respect to it, honoring it. Everything with food, at least if you want to be healthy with your food, has this element of respect. Our relationship with food, from, you know, from the farm to the table, really should be founded on respect. Again, we're stewards. We negotiate between heaven and earth. Not only are we stewards when we farm and garden, we're also stewards when we cook. So to be a good steward, to do our part, we really need to cook in a way that honors the ingredients that we harvest from nature and their unique attributes. After all, these ingredients, both plant and animal, have given up their lives for us so that we could live. To be really healthy, not just spiritually speaking, but physically speaking, we ought to honor the sacrifices that they've made for us. Now, I think, is a good time to talk about the microwave issue. I know, it is controversial, but who doesn't love a bit of controversy? So I just mentioned that all of our cooking methods are a way of paying respect to the food that we eat. We enter into a relationship with our food through the process of cooking, and we can tell whether this is a happy relationship through the process of eating, just the same way that you can tell how much love somebody put into their food by how good it tastes. In a way, restaurant food will never taste as good as home cooking because the person who is cooking for you at home hopefully loves you a lot more than that professional chef who's never met you. So it only follows that if we have a happy relationship with the food, the food should taste good, and that means that the food is healthy. And if we have an unhappy relationship with the food, the food will taste bad, or at least not as good, and this means that the food is unhealthy. This type of thing, this type of evaluation, is called organoleptics. What that means is that we use our senses, our organs, to determine the quality of something. This is commonly done with fine wine, but it's also done with your average gallon of milk on the shelf. Organoleptics is a really big part of how we understand the properties of a substance in Chinese medicine, whether that substance is a medicinal herb or whether it's a food. It makes sense, right? I mean, there were no laboratories in ancient China, so we had to analyze medicinal properties and analyze the quality of medicinal substances somehow. So, microwaves. Everyone has heard really mixed things about microwaves, like, oh, they'll kill you, they'll make your food radioactive, or maybe, oh, they're harmless, they just vibrate the bonds, and so on and so on. But really, the nail in the coffin for microwaves comes from organoleptics. Let me clarify. If food needs to be vibrant, flavorful, and full of life in order to be healthy, then microwaves are not just unhealthy, they're actually anti-healthy. Think about it from personal experience. You've got this healthy, flavorful, delicious home-cooked meal. It tasted so good last night. You have some more of it that you planned on eating for lunch the next day. So you boop, 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 zap it in the microwave, and after doing that, it just doesn't taste like it did the night before. It doesn't smell like it did the night before. That healthy, delicious, home-cooked meal has lost all of its flavor, and it just kind of tastes like a pile of slop. So how do we know that microwaves aren't healthy for you? Well, because the food you make in the microwave doesn't taste good. It doesn't taste like itself. Try heating up your leftovers any other way, on the stove, on the grill, whatever. I guarantee you, they will taste better. And, added benefit, you'll end up eating more of your leftovers. We can rationalize and expound upon this knowledge by testing the foods. And 
when we do that, we discover that microwaves actually reduce the vitamin content in the food. But the cool thing about organoleptics, the cool thing about Chinese medicine, is that all we really need to know is right under our nose, so to speak. We already knew from our taste that the food just isn't as good when you microwave it. Even though it seems like common sense, this organoleptics thing is actually kind of a revolutionary idea that you should be able to taste that things are healthy for you. It's a big deal. That a juicy, flavorful farmer's market a apple is actually healthier for you than an off-season, waxy, fluorescent lights in the big box store apple. The lesson of organoleptics is a particularly stark contrast to what Dr. Tom Cowan calls the cosmic joke theory of medicine. The cosmic joke theory is one that's really prevalent in mainstream Western medicine. They say that you shouldn't eat fats, that you shouldn't eat salt, that you shouldn't eat red meat, you shouldn't do all of these things. All these things that taste good, well, they're actually bad for you, and we figured it out with science. Ultimately, it comes down to this weird but prevalent worldview that the reason why fats and salts taste good is that we're, like, being punished by the universe. Like, it's all one big cosmic joke. Taking it from an organoleptics perspective, if food tastes good, it probably offers us something that we personally need. God isn't punishing us by making bacon. God made bacon because he loves us and he wants us to be happy. Things can get a little complicated with artificial substances like MSG, or things that are so thoroughly manipulated that they're basically artificial, like white refined sugar, but that is a huge and interesting topic that we will get into in a different episode, which is coming soon. Are natural things good and artificial things bad? It's a hot topic. So, rules one and two. Food has to have chi, and we have to conduct ourselves in a way that preserves the chi in terms of cooking, in terms of food storage, in terms of harvest, etc. Now for rule three. The chi of the food has to be accessible to us. Now part of the problem with raw broccoli is that raw broccoli has these thick, impenetrable cellulose walls, and we humans, unlike cows and a variety of other animals, we can't break down cellulose, we just don't have the gut bacteria. We just don't have four stomachs. We just simply don't have what it takes. So what do we need to do to access those vitamins and minerals? Well, we need to break down those cellulose walls. How do we do that? The first and most common way is cooking. It's very effective. There are other ways, too. You can also ferment, which is a type of external digestion. After all, we don't have the bacteria inside of our gut to break down the cellulose, but we can find the proper bacteria outside of our gut. There is a saying that I often use that I borrowed from my teacher, Jeffrey Yuen. Nutrition equals food plus digestion. Again, nutrition equals food plus digestion. If you can't digest it, it doesn't matter how healthy it is. It won't nourish you. It doesn't matter how many vitamins and minerals are trapped inside those cellulose walls. If you can't break them down, it's no good for you. So we need to break things down externally in order to make something, make them into something that we can use internally. In Chinese medicine, we have a very interesting way of abbreviating this whole discussion. We say that the function of the stomach is to ripen and rot the food. So if you put food in your stomach that's already ripe, you take out one step of the process and make the job easier for the stomach. If you put food in the stomach that's already rotted, that is already fermented, then you can take out another part of the stomach's job. All of this might sound familiar in terms of the discussion of raw vegetables, but the cool thing about this principle of ripening and rotting is that it applies to everything. It's a general principle about how the stomach works. So you often hear about the anti-nutrients, like lectins, that are found in grains and beans. And the way to denature these lectins is by sprouting the grains and beans. Using the idea of ripening and rotting, we see that the problem is that the grains and the beans, left to their own devices, really won't ripen and rot. Grains and beans are hard for our stomach to digest because they are shelf-stable. That's why they're useful. We put them in silos, we don't have to worry about them, we have food for the winter. They're shelf-stable. They won't rot. 
So in order to make them into something useful for us, we need to render them into something perishable, not shelf-stable. And sprouts are extremely perishable. They will go bad in your fridge very quickly, and when they go bad, they will get a strong smell really, really fast. I would like to take this moment to make a shout out to all of my Persians out there who will forever remember the smell of rotting sabzi, left over from the New Year's table, and waiting around until it can be finally thrown out on Sizibadar. It is a terrible smell, it is traumatizing, and I will never forget it. But returning to the Chinese medical physiology, we do have another benefit of understanding this discussion of food and perishability in terms of our organ principles, like the principle of the stomach is ripening and rotting. So if we understand things in that way, we can easily adapt to new phenomena, rather than you know making a new discovery of lectins or their anti-nutrients, making a new discovery of cellulose walls. If we just apply the general principle of ripening and rotting, all of these things and new things can actually be incorporated into them. So just because preservatives and artificial food additives didn't exist in ancient China doesn't mean that we can't apply our theory to them. So the problem with preservatives, and the problem with a lot of food additives, and part of the problem with hydrogenated oils, is that all of these things, pretty much all of our modern food innovations, are really designed to prevent ripening and rotting. So when they get into our stomach, they are fundamentally incompatible with what the stomach is trying to do. Even though these things that we've eaten look like food, and they look like food for longer amounts of time on the shelf, they're really not food. They're kind of like mummies. They're preserved, they're desiccated, they're really absent of that life, that chi that we really want to see in our food. And this doesn't just apply to artificial preservatives, this applies to all of your organic, all-natural, whole foods, shelf-stable foods. It applies to those gourmet crackers that you like to buy. If the food doesn't rot, it won't nourish you. That's what the principle says. That is, if the food doesn't rot, it's not food. This is, of course, a little oversimplified. Food that has a shelf life has a role in a healthy diet. We will get into this more on the next episodes on food, but varying our diet with seasonal changes is totally critical for health. So we generally Aussie eat a lot more nuts and root vegetables in winter, foods with a shelf life, and we generally ought to eat more fresh fruit, fruit and raw fish, like sushi or ceviche, in the summer, foods that are highly and rapidly perishable. So there is a time and a place for shelf-stable foods. Of course, everyone is different, and every health situation is different, and every climate is different, so even the winter-summer model is a major, major oversimplification. Like I said, we're keeping it light this episode, keeping it simple. So the three main rules that any healthy diet should abide by is 1. Eat food that has chi in it which comes about by fostering healthy relationships between you, heaven, earth, and your food. 2. Enter into a healthy and meaningful relationship with your food through the process of cooking and eating, which, summarized, is don't destroy the chi in your food. 3. Pay attention to whether your food is shelf-stable or not. Sometimes we do want food that is more shelf-stable, like eating dried fruit and nuts in the winter, and when we travel long distances in order to sustain us for long periods of time. But most of the time, we want food where the nutrition or the chi is readily available to us. There are some other nice rules in Chinese medicine, but I think that if you follow the three that I just mentioned, then the other rules kind of naturally fall out from them. Like, eat slowly, chew well, Enjoy your company as much as you enjoy your food. Nothing in excess, everything in moderation, that sort of thing. All of this seems pretty obvious if our number one priority with food is to enter into a healthy physical, mental, and spiritual relationship with our food. The last rule, before we sign off for this episode, comes from another attribute of the stomach. In Chinese medicine, we say that the stomach likes to empty and fill. And it likes to do this at regular intervals. 
And this applies to the intestines as well. It applies to all of the foo organs. So to facilitate this, we say that it's best to eat at regular times, and it's best to eat discrete meals, rather than nibbling a little bit all the time. For this one, rather than giving you an elaborate explanation, I'm just going to give you a challenge. I want you to try it yourself. Practice your organoleptics and see how you feel. See if you feel different when you eat three discrete meals versus nibbling a little bit all day, and see which one you like better. The foundation of Chinese medicine and our thinking about food came from people just like you, eating, digesting, and above all, noticing. Noticing how they felt. Noticing how different foods had different effects on them. And trying to notice trends. So the foundation of a healthy, meaningful, individual relationship with food is just that. Eating. Honoring. Noticing. So, stop thinking. Stop reading. Close your computers, shut that blog, close those books, go out there, hit the beach, and eat some beautiful, tasty fruit. I guarantee you that fruit will taste even better if you pick it yourself. That brings us to the end of this episode. I hope that you enjoyed it, and I hope that you learned a little something about food and diet, and I hope that you picked up some good general rules to guide your personal experimentations and explorations with food. In the next two episodes on food and diet, we will be discussing individual considerations, like which diet is perfect for you in particular, as well as, as some of the popular diets that are around nowadays and how to make sense of some of these hot trends. So until next time, keep asking questions and stay difficult. Thank you for listening to this episode of Classic of Difficulties. We hope that you enjoyed our explorations today, and we hope that you'll tune in next time for more difficult questions. If you have any topics you want us to cover, or any awesome health professional you know that you'd like to see us interview, we would love to meet them. So reach out and let us know. Please share this episode with your friends, your family, your co-workers, your enemies, and everyone in between. Your interaction and support helps us keep making the content that we love to make, and that you love to listen to.